the goodies that I'm working on that are bubbling away. And so we can just look at some of the more creative ways to ferment cabbage. Because cabbage, of course, is the, uh, the vegetable, you know, the primary vegetables that people simply have been fermenting for years. But we can take a lot of food right out of our own garden that we can add to the fer ferment. Uh, beets, carrot, herbs, spices. Um, look at these great big jars of dried jalapenos. There's enough there, I think, to, to feed a family for the next 20 years. <laughs> or make some terrific hot sauce. Because indeed, uh, you can add a pepper to a jar of fermented uh, foods to just make up spicy. And um, the biggest reason, really and truly, why I started to ferment, not only to preserve food for the winter time and beyond, that you harvest in the fall, but also to feed proper gut bacteria. And if you know that most of the food allergies or sensitivities, they really do begin in your gut. It's not in your stomach, it's nowhere else, but the fermentation process um, in your gut is simply out of balance. It's called dysbiosis. And if your microbes and your bacteria in your gut, in your whole digestive system, are not balanced, sooner or later something will break. And I've read this line a few weeks ago. I mean, the lining of our small intestines, they are a hair width thick. So you're simply just like a tiny little spit, a hair width away from feeding yourself or being fed by the backup from the sewage outside. So this is something what they call a leaky gut. When that tiny little film of gut um, has little holes in it because irritants from food have digested foods and your food ends up in your bloodstream rather than stays protected. It is only a matter of time, a year, two years, three years, where you're going to have digestive problems, you have food allergies, you have um, all these chronic diseases that are super hard to treat. One dose, if you backtrack, like I have a lot of people coming to me, well, what should I do? Nothing's working. Uh, the first question I generally ask, when did this start? When did your skin problems start? When did your allergies start? When did all these food sensitivities to gluten, to dairy, sometimes strawberries, like healthy foods, people do not tolerate them. It almost always points back to, I had a huge infection, was on antibiotics for two months, and since then, I have it cleared up the infection, but since then, I have not been able to eat all the foods I like, not getting energy out of it, sometimes sick, I mean, talk to a celiac person. Now, that's usually, often, but not always, a genetic issue. Maybe just 5% of the time celiac is inherited, but definitely all the gluten sensitivities, the dairy sensitivities, the corn sensitivities, that is plain and simple that your gut is out of harmony. The good bugs, the bad bugs, they just, the bad bugs are, been over or the good bugs have been overpowered by the bad ones so and just say okay well I'm I just had lots of yogurt after my couple of weeks of antibiotics it's not enough you need a huge variety of good bacteria because if you think in terms of the human body it might have two billion cells but it has trillions of microbes and bacteria that regulate pretty much everything they are the ones that are talking to the cells. They are the ones that regulate where food goes. They are the ones that gobble up the garbage from your body. You have to think of every little cell as a community. 
a community with workers, a community that picks up the garbage, a community that brings stuff to the right place at the right time. And that is what bacteria and microbes do, par excellence. Now, if you think like a bottle of probiotics or even a bottle of prebiotics, they're always going to be helpful. But if you know that one teaspoon of sauerkraut has the same amount or more and more varied microbes and bacteria that will feed your gut and that will ultimately, hopefully, if you watch what you're eating a little bit, and um, will heal you. People think, or you, you go to a doctor and say, oh, you'll have this the rest of your life. And this, is, this can be true for people, and it's misery. And um, so I guess fermentation is just one answer of how to bring back balance into your body. So besides that, it's quite fun. It's very inexpensive and um, it's easy to do. What you see here, I'll just I'll take this with me. Um, I, sure, uh, good idea. I started making sauerkraut probably six, seven years ago and uh, Usually because you have a ton of cabbages in the garden that you don't know what to do with and you can only eat so much coleslaw. Um, so I started making sauerkraut. My fermentation bottle is right here. There's so much information here, it blows you away. But most of all, I think if you read the first chapter, you get a sense of how truly powerful food can be to rebuild your, the, a system that's broken. And a system that cannot be healed with medicine usually makes it worse. Or it helps for a while, and then you're right back at square one. So the foods, of course, that ferment the easiest are the ones that are crisp and have a ton of lactic acid. Like if actually you leave sauerkraut out in a room, you, you mush it up a little bit, it starts to ferment. If you, you have other foods that you can add to it, tons of them actually, but you really need to work it to bring the juices out. Um, so like this, these, these two guys, it, it took me maybe an hour in total to get a batch of kombucha, kombucha, kombucha going, or, and, and this. So, this, these two jars full, one whole cabbage. You start, you put it in a large bowl. I just knead it, I put a little bit of salt on it, rock salt, pure salt, and you work it until everything is juicy. You know, you can actually squeeze the cabbage so the juices come out. Then you just, I just do this rather than in a big crock. I know there's people and in the olden days, everybody had a sauerkraut crock. In, in the cellar, and they would eat from that all winter long. I find it handy to just put it in a glass jar and then let it sit on the counter for, I don't know, 10 days maybe, depending on the temperature, and you taste it. If it tastes just right, cool it. Put it in the fridge. Now, I've done these workshops to make fermented food for a long time, and um, one of the ladies, I don't know, must have gone really all out because she made a hundred jars of sauerkraut. She must have a big family. And she texted me and all the jars sealed. She processed it. Heat. Well, we all know what heat does <laughs> to bacteria. So she lost a lot of that goodness. And she'll still have the fiber and the taste and the enjoyment. but. Once the fermentation process is finished, you just put it in the fridge, and that's it. And after it's cooled, you know, I, you can just put one of these lids on. The only thing when things go awry is when 
the actual cabbage is not properly covered by the brine. And so in order for me, to prevent that, I've tried everything from putting a sterilized rock in the top to keep the top leaf, uh, pushing it down. So you, you can buy these, they call them pickle pebbles. Little glass, heavy weights. They're awesome. And I actually Googled a fermentation and something like healthferment.org came up. And I signed up for their newsletter. And of course, right away, you know, they are sending you emails with all the fermenting tools that you could possibly buy. But I think once you know, if you were to Google pickling pebbles on Amazon, I would imagine you get it. I bought this at Nature's Fair in Kelowna. I'd never seen them before, but the minute I saw them, I think, bingo. <laughs> if you don't fill the jar too tight, you can just fold up a couple of whole cabbage leaves and, and really press it down, and that has worked for years. Like, that's what people did with the uh, crock pots. They just made sure they had a good layer of solid leaves on the top. They would put a lid on, a wooden lid, would fit inside the crop, put a rock on it. Let it sit, taste it. I know three, four years ago, I, I, John and I went uh, to the Netherlands to visit family, and I had made a batch of sauerkraut before I left. Well, Anna had never seen this before. And of course, you have a few days where it gets pretty stinky in the house. Something feels really rotten. So she traced it out upstairs. That's where it's coming from. And she saw my batches of sauerkraut and they were stinky. <clears throat> there were some goofy looking stuff on the top. So she put it outside. Mom, your sauerkraut went nuts. This is wrong. And of course, I took the top layer off. I scooped it off and it was the best sauerkraut. <laughs> I was so glad she didn't just throw it in the compost. <laughs> five jars, that's like six cabbages, <laughs> and the work, and the time, and the lids, yeah. So you can find some wonderful, wonderful fermented, crisp vegetables under what looks like something that should be thrown out. Because it's bacteria, it's a fermentation process. If you go to a winery and you see the scus that floats on top of all these grapes that have been mashed, Yes. So that's the process. It bubbles, it's alive. So what I've done here, this is straight cabbage, and I put some apple in because apples are falling off the tree at the moment, and I put some fennel seeds in because I love the taste and smell of fennel. You can put a hot pepper in, you can put cloves in. Um, traditionally, the German recipe, they would put juniper berries in. And still, when you buy properly fermented German sauerkraut, and you can get it at the, at the windmill, uh, you, you usually find some um, juniper berries a few on top. I love putting cloves in, you can put a bay leaf in. Um, you can add a leaf of kale or two in the mix. So you get green. On its own, or kale on its own, can be fermented, but I tell you, that is powerful stuff. Like, I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> but I was very tempted to grab or leave a kale out of the garden and try it, and then I thought, eh, I will. So I did actually knead that cabbage, and then I, the last little bit, I left and I grated a beet and I put some beet in. So this, this of course, you can see little pieces of apple. Maybe it had a quarter cup of beets, no more. Because you put too much in. And it won't really look so palatable. Uh, this one is from last year, and that was a mix of red cabbage and white cabbage. But predominantly white cabbage. Ratio maybe one to no, five for that. Carrots, you can go one to ten. I often use carrots. And you get these 
lovely, lovely colors. Um, plus, you have the roots. And it's advised, of course, when you use your root crops, uh, you can make it really spicy with horseradish, rotabaga, radishes. You can add some of that in. But be aware in terms of what the individual flavors do. Um, people pickle beans. Never done it. But this is something you can truly experiment with. Um, let me see, what else have I got? And next on, on my, you know, I would say weekly or monthly fermentation or a product that I always have in the fridge is kombucha. Some people call it rejuvela, but kombucha. And if you can closer, you can actually pass this around. You'll see this goofy little thing floating in there. It's called the scoby or the mother. This is, this is the part that starts off every ferment and sourdough, all of those things, you can, you know, keep some from the past batch, put it in the fridge, and you will always and always have a new starter. So not everything needs a starter, like cabbages, just a little bit of salt and a little bit of hand work, but there are foods that do just better with a starter. So. For the kombucha, simple. I buy organic green tea, uh, uh, just brew it, about four cups of it with eight bags. You add a cup of sugar to that, let it cool, and then simply add water and uh, maybe a pint of leftover kombucha with this mother. So, um, and if anybody is looking to start kombucha, I always have tons of these uh, scobies because every single ferment, it grows another skin and the skins can be separated and used for the next, for the next batch. And rarely doesn't it turn out. The fun thing with the kombucha is the longer you leave it, the more tart it becomes. Because that cup of sugar, of course, is there and it's really quite sweet. I don't like to have a lot of sweet in my drinks. So you leave it for eight days, nine days, and I basically just stick a straw in it and drink it because I make it in, in big gallon jugs. You don't want to start pouring that thing. <laughs> so stick a straw in it, sip it, a few more days, I think. Or perfect. Um, then, if you want to have fun with kombuchas, and you've seen kombuchas in the store, all sorts of flavor. Your ginger kombucha, your citrus kombucha. So you give it a second ferment. When this is done, in a week or so, I can now put it in a bottle, add, for instance, a little bit of sugar or mashed up berries, like strawberries. Um, I often put ginger in. And, and a little bit of sugar to keep it going again, and you get a beautiful fizzy ferment. If you put it in a closed bottle, like the ones that you buy some wine, like that they close with a cork, you know what I mean? The metal kind of lid that's attached to the bottle. Did I bring one? No. And then that keeps. The only thing you have to watch for that you leave some breathing room because they can explode. They can. But I've had the same problem with processed apple juice in jugs, where we did a lot of apple juice and one of those guys just exploded in the cool room. It's not pretty when <laughs> that happens. Um, so I hope that gets you a sense of it's simple, it's doable. You might have the odd failure, but it's not gonna kill you if something went wrong. And when something does go wrong, the odd, odd time is when you've been a little careless, the glass is not properly sterilized, and something, you know, cross-contaminated, you will know, because it smells really off. But it's my experience that the first time when people try something new, they follow directions. Sort of. I know you don't, don't. <laughs> but you're experienced. But it's a new adventure for some people, and it's intriguing, and they do their best to get it right. 
first. And once they get a sense of what it should look and smell like and taste like, they think it's the cat's meow. And it's lovely to have things like this that are healing to your gut and that feed your good bacteria to, to have a well-balanced digestive system, for crying out loud. <laughs> right? Like, when food doesn't go down the pipe in the right ways, there's a problem. And out of that, you don't get properly nourished. And, and, and you can get like thyroid issues because your gut's not working. Almost everything goes, points back to a digestive system with flaws, like little holes, little inadequacy, not, a, not enough acid. How many people are using um, antacids? How are they gonna digest the proteins? So it's better to eat the foods that you can digest and you find out how to just feed your gut so that everybody knows and works in harmony.